Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. How's it going, man? I'm, Hello, I'm Ty. very unprepared yeah. this week. I'm very what? unprepared. I, I, I had a rough night. I barely got any sleep. I took like a short nap before we started this, and uh, I, I, like, I'm barely here right now. So I'm super unprepared. So what are we talking about today, Wes? Uh, we're going to talk about a show called The Expanse. What was your rough night? Like, I, I, well, I have a, I have a sleep problem and some nights I just like the chemical that kicks off in your brain that says it's time to sleep now. Like it's, it's very uh-huh. hit and miss for me. So I get, uh-huh. I get more and more and more and more tired, like where I'm exhausted, uh-huh. but my brain never says, uh-huh. okay, go, go ahead and go to sleep now. Uh, yeah. So. Right. Is that how your library and your brain of movies yes. is so That is exactly vast? why. Cause I, I sit and I watch movies all night because I can't fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because you can't fall asleep. What about reading? I also do read. read? Yeah. So yeah, I have a, I have a lot of extra time to do stuff, but the next day is not is not fun. So what could be a flaw is actually an advantage for you because you're a writer now and you write in, in TV. So all those years of staying up and watching, <laughs> yeah. and hours and hours and hours. Yeah, and hours my of my my brain is, uh, chemistry problem actually is a superpower. That's uh that that totally makes sense to me. Okay, today's episode is triple point. It was written by Georgia Lee and directed by the longest-running Expanse director, yep. Jeff Wolnow. Every season, Jeff has directed every season. Yeah, Breck, Breck has more episodes because a couple seasons Breck did more than one block, so he wound up with more mm. episodes. But yeah, Jeff is the only one who's done all six seasons. And is Trimple Point the representing three different factions coming to a head in, in this episode with yeah. the, the belt, Mars, and Earth? So now when the Agatha King and Admiral Wynn is, he is there and he's basically taken over the ship and he feels compelled to go to IO. Um, and nobody can really figure out why are we going to IO? Shouldn't we be going? Isn't there, what is it? Callisto? What is it? Uh, yeah, there, there's a big battle happening near the shipyards on Callisto. Everybody's thinking we should be going to Callisto and support the UN fleet there. And what is Wynn's motivation to go to IO? Is it, is it, is it cause he wants to get control of the hybrids? It's because he's going there to pick them up, to t- pick take delivery up. of the weapon system. Okay, yeah. so he's going there to pick them up. Yeah. But so when he when he releases them throughout the thing is because he knows he's it's not going to happen that way. Yeah. So he just he just go ahead and start and use and uses them well, anyway. The plan was always to use them to attack Mars. That was always uh-huh. the plan. Right. So when it looks like the plan to pick them up is going to fail, he just fires them and fires and you know, yeah. aims them at Mars. Yeah. And so to give you a little backstory to see where he's coming from um uh one of his uh what what's the guy's name the guy that's loyal to him the oh his 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 aide um i don't remember what that guy's name was well it it doesn't matter because here's the thing (laughs) i i love a good robert shaw uss annapolis backstory and i love it when they when they're staring out in space and usually there's alcohol involved and usually there's this camaraderie and bonding and it usually comes from a high point that goes into a dark point so the contrast is really great and i wanted i wanted win to give me this story about the yashi basically the story is is that there was a, a blockade and there were four un destroyers and they were facing off with one martian ship and it called the yashi and then something happened there was they got a little somebody fainted there was a shot something happened and Every, all hell broke loose, and when the smoke cleared, that one Martian ship basically disabled and took out all UNN destroyers, yep. and he lost 29 of his crew on that ship. So, you know, I wanted him to be with, like, Southern and being like, you think I'm, you think this is tough? Let me tell you what hell's all about. I lost 29 of my men, you know, or something like that. And, you know, we were, it was a cold, because it's always cold in space, and it's always night. And telling his story about what happened. And then, then you get that and you're like, oh, okay. Because like when Robert Shaw told his, his story and his relationship to sharks, you're like, and he, it's like, okay, I get it. I know where he's coming from. I know who he is. I know what's motivating him. And I like the story. And you know what's interesting is to see, to see a man, basically they got their ass kicked, right? And I wonder how many people in power are making decisions based off insecurity. Uh, based off fear i think most of them yeah most of them and that's a scary thing you know if you have if there's a guy that got his ass kicked on the playground 
and then he's a pos- in position of power later. There's still this this need, this this uh, yep. this revenge that runs deep within them that motivates certain things. And the higher up they go, the, the human nature is human nature. And no matter how powerful you are, that does not absolve you of your fear and your insecurities. Yep. And those fear and insecurities are still steering the ship. It's just those people when they're flip flipping switches. The more powerful they are, the more people die. Um, so now we understand what is motivating when. Because, you know, even though that they're doing things that are really terrible and, and in, in some ways they're orchestrating this fictitious war, he knows or he believes, he feels that Martian technology is clearly superior to them and they don't really have a choice. And they have to make sure that they have the weapon before they do. And it's, you know, it's, it's the same thing. With nuclear weapons, it's the same kind of mentality and who's going to get in with North Korea and everything that's happening right now. So, Sinopoli delivers uh, Avicerella's message to Captain Carino. She's a little bit skeptical, to say the least. And, I mean, to me, that's a hard story to swallow. Yeah. Right? So, like, imagine if I came to you, Ty, and we were in war. And I came and I and I had and I was all beat the fuck up. And I'm like, Ty, I just talked to Kamala Harris. <laughs> she was in my taxi. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> it's like, you know what I'm saying? You're like, all right, man, maybe you need to lay down or whatever. It, it's hard for me to swallow that she would send that message on because this is an admiral of their enemy, of their fleet during wartime in this whole situation. But, but now in the example you just gave though, it's not that you just come to me and say, I was in the taxi with Kamala Harris and and I have this thing. Then you pull out your phone and you show me video that was like secretly recorded of like Kim Jong Un talking about his nuclear Kim weapon Jong-un. program. Then I'm probably going to believe you. I'm going to be like, holy okay, shit, no. dude. What, what I'm saying is you guys do a good job of creating this character of who she is. This lady that is level headed. Yeah. That is that she has this moral compass that ultimately she's going to do what she has to do. But she senses something's wrong about this fight, and she'll do what she has to do, but she doesn't love this war. She doesn't love the situation she's in, and she knows a fight is coming, so she sees this, and this makes sense to it. Whereas if you would have gave that message to Chuck Norris in a 1980s action movie... You know he would have kicked you in the face. <laughs> he would have kicked you in the face and said, you're weak and you're being weak. But if you had Chuck Norris, you wouldn't have to worry about the hybrids. No, because, because Chuck Norris, like the Invasion USA Chuck Norris, Uzi in each hand... Just mowing down hybrids. USA. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, just a little a little tidbit for people who listen to this podcast that people who don't listen to this podcast aren't going to get. A uh, little spoiler here for you. Captain Carino, you'll see her again in season six. She's coming back. We liked, we liked her so much, we brought her back. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, a little, little oh. heads up. We're going to get a little extra Captain Carino. Does she die in season six? Everybody dies in season six. That's how the show ends. Everybody dies. Oh, Everybody shit. What, did I say that out loud? <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh, so Carino ends up sending the message anyway. She's realized that there's something there. She saw Aaron Wright. She realized this is very important. And you guys did a good job of creating something that seems really logically motivated. So she sends it on. And it gets to Souther. Basically, the crew that's loyal to Souther. It gets to them. They show it to Souther. He goes in and verifies it with Cortazar. And basically, coach yard. Yeah, and I, you, some, somebody on uh, somebody was on YouTube was like, "Will somebody tell Wes that it's Kachar and Cortazar?" Because I, <laughs> I switch up their names all the time. So thank you, uh, number five. We should name them. Yeah. Number five, number one, number two, number but, six. But then, but then everybody's gonna start fighting over who gets to be number one. Yeah, you know, it's like that whole true. scene in Reservoir Dogs where like yeah. everybody would wind up fighting over who gets to be Mister Black, Mister Mister Black. Yeah, yeah. But it, you know what? It's our advantage for customer service because we literally could answer if everyone wrote us an email. We could literally answer all six of them every yeah it's every true. Uh, so that interaction is really maybe we should go with the reservoir dog naming system yeah. instead of one through six. We could call them like Mister Yellow and Mister White. Oh and yeah, Mr. Blonde. Yeah, yeah. Mister Pink. We'll pick somebody to be Mister Pink. We'll pick yeah whoever whoever wants to be Mister Pink. You let us know, and you could be Mister Pink, Red, Black, Yellow, Blue, Mister Brown, which is like Mister Shit. Just quoting from Reservoir Dogs now. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I got to be pink? Who wants to be pink? Yeah. <laughs> so she sends it along. He verifies it. He knows this is true. And he goes on the, uh, the flight deck, and uh, he challenges Wynn. And Wynn pushes back. Well, I guess, it, I guess the mutiny's already happened, right? Because it's his ship. 
Yeah. And so Wynn already came and took it over. He's just taking his ship back. Well, you know, because Wynn has the legal right to take that ship. He's a higher rank. He has the legal right to take it. In order for it to become a mutiny, it has to be somebody taking control of the ship who does not have the legal right to do so. That's what the conversation in a lot of the mutiny movies is about, is somebody saying, I'm legally removing you from command, and the person who's being removed from command going, no, this is actually a mutiny. Um, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's the whole thing. So when Denzel Washington relieved Gene Hackman in uh, Crimson Tide, I always thought that happened kind of easy because you know, they're, they're going back and forth, and he's like, okay, all right, you know, you need to think this through. And he went there, he goes, all right, you're arrested. Go to your quarters. Here's your thing. And Hackman sits back and he thinks about it. And he says, you're in over your head. He hands him his clipboard, hands him the key, and he walks back to his uh, his room. Yeah. Is that protocol? Is that policy? Well, in like, that what? case, that was a really specific, I don't, obviously I'm not a, in Navy submarine command. So I, I, the, all the rules are kind of mysterious to me, but I do know one of the rules is you cannot have a nuclear launch unless all three of the people with the keys agree that there should be a nuclear launch. There's a reason why that rule exists so mm-hmm. that one guy can't just go launch a bunch of missiles, right? And it's a, an important rule. And when Hackman is trying to force somebody who doesn't agree with him to launch the missiles, he is circumventing the rules that were put in place to prevent exactly that thing. Mm-hmm. So in that way, he is behaving in an illegal manner. That's the, the reason, the justification for Denzel Washington to say you're relieved because, well, you, you were in the military. You know, Ed, there's always rules. There's rules of engagement. There's rules of how things work. And the military takes those rules very seriously. And if the military yeah. says the rule is you cannot fire a missile unless these people all agree and one of those people doesn't agree, you can't fire the missile. That's the rule. You can't do it. Yeah, so for me, I think that... Uh I understand the rules and I understand the yeah. rules in place, but I'm talking about that movie specifically and it's been a while since, since I've seen it. I don't remember how it exactly plays out, but yeah. I didn't think that Hackman would follow the rules. Would give up that easy. Yeah. Would give up that easy. Yeah. So when that happened, I was expecting more of a showdown and I didn't, I was surprised. And then maybe he comes back later. I can't remember. He does. Exactly. Yeah. He, yeah. He's, he, he definitely engineers things so he gets his position back. Yeah. Right. So then Souther is able to get the word out you know, basically to both sides. Here's the situation. Here's what's going on. Because the Martian ships have been in shooting distance and they haven't shot. They haven't. And he's saying, listen, they're testing our honor. They're they're making sure they don't want this war. They want to figure out what's going on. Then Wynn goes full bad shit. I mean, he that Yashi's back just got triggered in his mind and deep in his recessed memory somewhere. And he ends up shooting Souther. They take back over the ship. Then one of the UN destroyers that's loyal to Souther starts to disengage. First of all, he threw some. I wonder if that was a stunt guy on the day, or if that was an extra. The guy that he threw out of the chair. <laughs> the guy, like, <laughs> you remember that he like grabbed and yanked his ass out of the chair, and he flew across the thing. Um, it, yeah. Whenever you have uh, a move like that, you're almost always going to use either a stunt performer or a special skills person. So then he throws her out of the chair. He sits down and he shoots on his own ship, his own fleet. Which blows my mind. It's interesting that you bring that up because that is actually my answer to, you know, you, you were saying you love the Robert Shaw scene in Jaws where he talks about his past and why he hates sharks, um, which, as you, you said, is a beautiful scene, maybe, maybe the best scene in that entire movie. It's an amazing sequence. And Robert Shaw is a fantastic actor. But the reason why you're never going to get that scene from Wynn is because that scene has, there's some vulnerability in it. I think mm-hmm. Robert Shaw in that moment while he's drinking and he's hanging out with these guys that he sort of has become friendly with, there's this real vulnerability in exposing this horrible moment from your past that, you, that you're that you still afraid of, right? Mm-hmm. I think with Wynn, I think Wynn is so insecure about what happened. He would never have that moment. He would never have that moment of vulnerability where he shared the thing that frightens him from his past um, because it takes a real confidence to be vulnerable. And I think the difference Mm -hmm. is Quint is an incredibly confident man who has this dark past. I think Wynn is an incredibly insecure man who has this dark past. And you see the way those two things play out, and they're they're very different ways that they play out. You know, you can either confront your the fears from your past and let those fears make you a better person, or you can obsess over those fears and become weak and insecure. And I think the way that Wynn does. And by the way. I, I want to give a shout out here to to Byron, who is the actor who plays Byron Mann, who plays Wynn, who is a fantastic actor. 
and did a great job. So this is the, all of all of Wynn's vulnerability. Uh, no, excuse me, not vulnerable. All of Wynn's insecurity and the way it plays out and the way he plays that character out. That's Byron did a fantastic job playing that part. He, yeah, I, I would. I, I thought he did an excellent job, and especially like if he would have had his uh, moment of his backstory, which you just argued against. <laughs> I mean, imagine how great that would have been. If yeah, but but can you imagine way. that character being vulnerable in that way? You, if he would have to be in a usually alcohol is involved, right? There has to be because everybody, everybody, even Chuck Norris in nineteen eighties action film, they you can't help it. You have you have a vulnerable moment, a moment that you haven't been able to cover. There's just a something that got caught. You can cover it up real fast, but there's always, always going to be a vulnerable moment in any person's life, except so you know. But he's so insecure, and he is so hell bent on what he thinks is best for Earth, but ultimately, like, the pride and the ego of the UN military and being on Earth, and he releases the hybrids. That is a reckless move because he, it is a weapon that he does not understand, and it's not even fully developed yet. What does he know at this point about the hybrids? Through the season, we've seen the data that was sent out, the sales document data. I mean, Bobby finds it on that that, you know, when Officer Ola gives her the thing and it talks about Project Caliban and, you know, uh, how a single hybrid was able to kill a UN and Martian Marine strike force in however many minutes it killed him. So they've got a lot of data on how it works. And they also, you wind up seeing the, the data on, you know, how the, how the pods work that they're being loaded into and, and all that stuff. So they have all the information. They know what this is. They know that it is these hybrids with the, which they've seen kill a bunch of soldiers. They know the hybrids are loaded into these pods that are supposed to get them to their, you know, the delivery mechanism to get them to their target. And the plan was always to use them on Mars. Now, I think, I think what drives Wynn to fire them when he does is the very real possibility that they're going to lose this, that the Martians are going to beat them, that the Martians are going to be able to stop them from taking delivery of this weapon and so he's in this moment where like i've got 20 icbms that have been built to attack my enemy my enemy's about to ca capture the facility where those icbms are and rather than allow them to fall into enemy hands it's better for me to fire them at that enemy and that's right what he so does. so they have the sales pitch idea of what this weapon is yeah so if they fire these pies and what what is it what, is, what does it do? It hits the Martian ship. The protomolecule monster is unleashed and it destroys that ship and everybody on it. No, they're it. firing them the at ideas? Mars. Oh, they're firing them at Mars. They're it's firing them at Mars. Mars. Yeah. Wow. Now, some of the pods get shot. Some of them get blown up. One of them gets knocked off course by being shot and slams into the Egg of the King, which I'm sure you're going to talk about later. But, but some of the pods don't make it, but all of them are actually targeted at Mars. Imagine if you're at war with a country and... You like that would kind of be well, I guess this would work because it's different planets. But if you were at war, but you had zombies, you had real live zombies and they didn't. Yeah. Would you would you launch zombies into their country because then just cause all out chaos? Um, I the problem is, I is that eventually that, that chaos would. would blood, yeah. Oh, 100 percent. They would. I guarantee people would because, you know, in in medieval times, one of the weapons that they would use is they would take people who are infected with the plague and fire them over the walls of an enemy castle with a catapult to give the people inside the castle plague. Yeah. So I guarantee you if they if the zombies existed, somebody would be packing zombies into like, you know, C one thirties and dropping them on the other people's <laughs> cities. Could you imagine being at war and all of a sudden you see like ah a catapult like ah a dude's flying over, just landing that has COVID and like just yep. landing on each side. You know, yeah, that that's what I'm saying to you is that uh, I believe that is definitely something that somebody would do if, yep. if 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 a country had access to real life zombies, they'd be like, Fire the zombies not realizing that over time those zombies will find their way back to you. Yep. That'd be an interesting premise for a movie. Like they're at war and they fire zombies at the at the countries to start the thing. I, I, um, I'm sure they would do it because, look, even with nuclear weapons. But, but here's the thing, though. Like, if you fire zombies at a country and now they have their own zombies, wouldn't they fire their zombies back at you? Sure. I, I mean, when you threw a spear at the other team, they could pick that spear up and throw it back at you. Right. I mean, that's why yeah. the, the Romans actually built spears that were designed to break after they hit or bend so that they couldn't be thrown back at them. Like they, there was like they were developing spear technology so it couldn't be 
world back at their side. Right. But yeah, I mean, but yeah, like I was going to say, even with nuclear weapons, like let's say the U.S. had like launched a first strike on, on Russia, USSR, and it totally worked and no Russian missiles ever got launched. And so the, the U.S. is like, yay, we totally won. We wiped out the USSR with our missiles and they didn't even get to shoot back. Those clouds of radioactive dust don't just stay in one place. That shit is going to encircle the globe. We're all going to get fucking radiated. Our crops are going to die. We're all going to get cancer. That's that's true even with like any weapon like that. So I'm sure somebody would think the same thing, you know, like, oh, well, sure, maybe some zombies will show up on our shores, but we'll deal with it later. You remember when Matthew Broderick got in a, a, a war game with a computer and almost started a nuclear war? I do remember that. And then, that was scary. It was really scary. I, I also remember that uh, Ali Sheedy was in that. It started yeah. my teenage crush on Ali Sheedy. Yeah. And what that, was the, that what was, was the name of the computer Whopper? I that think was, was Whopper. my that was my first Ali Sheedy experience. Yeah, that was before Breakfast Club. That was before. I, it might have been oh. one of the first movies she was in. Yeah, interesting. One, one of her. Early I haven't films. seen Ali Sheedy in a while. I think the last thing I saw was uh, Short Circuit with her in it. She has done some stuff in the not too distant past, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Yeah, she's still around. So Jules Pierre Mao. And Strickland are talking to Katoa. Oh, let me ask you a question. Was that set inspired by the fifth element with Katoa that's in the capsule, like Mila, Mila Jonovic in the fifth element when she's in that capsule that goes all the way around? The um, glass capsule? You would have to ask uh, Tony, the production designer, if he was inspired. Because, like, that's, it's one of those things. So, it, like, here's, some, here's a, a deep dive on how TV shows work for the, the one person in the audience who actually gives a shit about this. So the way it works is, you know, a script is written. Georgia wrote the, the first draft of the script. The showrunner then, you know, will like revise it and create a production draft out of that script. And then the showrunner will have meetings with all of the various department heads, the keys, and tell them what he wants. So the key will say, okay, so there's a, there's a pod in this episode in the script. What should that look like? Noreen, our showrunner, will go, well, we should be able to, it should be transparent so we can see the creature inside. It should be big enough to hold the thing. It should look like it's really secure so the monster can't bat his way out. So the, he gives kind of vague direction like that. And then Tony, the production designer, will go to his team and they'll come up with what the pod looks like. And they'll bring it back and go, how does this look? While the producers give direction on what things should look like, the departments actually, it's their creativity that comes up with what that specific thing looks like. So I'm sure the people in Tony's department have seen The Fifth Element. <laughs> And it would not surprise me if somebody in that department was using that as inspiration, but they never specifically said that. So I, I don't know for sure if that's what they did. Well, I very much enjoyed it. I, I thought it was really cool and I liked it. So Katoa is going in and out of Proto Monster to Katoa, young boy, and he's going back and forth. And he's basically like, you know, we can't stop the work. It's almost finished. We're close. We're close. And then he goes full monster mode and starts breaking that capsule that he's in. And... Now Jules Premier is like, all right, what, what's the work? We're almost there. We're, we're like, we're so close. We got to get to this thing, and he gets so excited about it that he says, "We need another subject because yep. we can't talk to Kato anymore." And Strickland says, "Well, there's there's May, you know, who's actually perfect and primed and ready to go." And this that big decision because May happens to be the the young girl that reminds him of his daughters. Yep. It's the one that he formed a connection and relationship with. So every bit of that good angel has got his ass whooped on that other end of the shoulder by the devil on that shoulder. And now he is, what is he, Ty? He is cold-blooded. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cold-blooded. To, be, to take May, who reminds you, first of all, a little girl, a, a kid to go through that, right? Yeah. But somebody that reminds him of his own children, and he had a relationship and connect. He's like, yeah, use May. Let's sacrifice her because I want to figure out this thing, and I want to control this, this power. Cold-blooded, man. Now, I'm not saying he's not a bad guy because he is a bad guy. But he also, again, it's that existential threat because he believes that whatever the work is, May that whatever that work is may end with the annihilation of the human species, maybe our extinction. And he, he's and so he's looking at do I sacrifice one person and save everybody? That's the math that he's going off. Now he's still a bad guy. I'm not saying he's right. I'm not saying he's a good guy. And no, I would not like. Yeah, you know, this makes remember that scene in Game of Thrones uh, where Stannis burns up his daughter to, to as a sacrifice to the red guy. Spoilers for Game of Thrones, by the way, if you haven't watched that show. 
I, I remember watching that and being like, I cannot imagine any, I like, I don't even have kids. I cannot imagine any circumstance in which I would sacrifice a sweet little kid for anything. So when I'm watching Jules Pierre Mao do this, I have the same reaction to it. Like, I can't imagine any circumstance in which I burn up some sweet kid to, for my own benefit. Like, I could never, like, I'm just not that guy, just in, incapable of that decision. Yeah. But I do understand the decision. Like, the, I understand no, but the, see, the I, I, I agree Intellectually, I understand it. Yeah, I, yeah, intellectually, you understand that. But you have to be a certain type of person to feel as if you could have any kind of say in, in the the existence of humanity that to, to ultimately you look at this situation and the reality is, is even if you do do this to me, it doesn't guarantee it. You are not that powerful that there is a sequence of events that are set in place. And that is, you, you're not going to make a decision to save humanity. There's something. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It's, there is yeah. a megalomania to it for sure, but yeah. we see examples of it all the time. I mean, Look, look at the, you know, we've got billionaires now who are like, oh, I'm going to create my own space program. I'm going to be the one who moves humanity to Mars. There's a megalomania to that, that like I'm so powerful that I can establish a human foothold on another planet. There's been megalomaniacs throughout history who are like, you know, Hitler honestly believed that he was the, the messiah of the Germanic people. The point I'm making is that you and I are not of that breed. No, I. Yeah. And so there's a megalomania to him thinking that he is the person that can save humanity. Yeah. There's so many situations where somebody like Hitler, or whatever, justifies their actions by thinking that they're saving humanity by this twisted logic. Humanity is way too complex and complicated and intricate for any one person to make a decision to have that kind of impact on it. And I think at the end of the day, you look at the situation and say, all I can really control or do is keep my side of the street clean yeah. and do what I think is right within that moment. And so that type of thinking uh, is what scares me the most, because if they're looking at this and saying, well, this is going to impact humanity, what choice I make now is going to impact and save our species against something bigger than that. It's like you, you do not have that power, no matter what you choose. You're not in control of that. So that that's the point I'm making. Well, but but <laughs> there are very real examples of people who did have enormous impacts on the human race that did have enormous power in a in a specific moment, and especially what we're seeing now with the you know because there's always been very rich people and there's always been like the top tier rich people. What we're seeing now is the rise of the mega billionaire. You know, mm -hmm. guys who don't just have like billions of dollars, they have hundreds of billions of dollars. Guys so rich that they can build their own space program, right? That is not a thing that has really existed in the modern world before this. And you can really see how when you have that level of wealth and power, like I trust me, if, if a guy with $500 billion in the bank calls the White House, the president's talking to him on the phone. They, they have such enormous economic power in, in our society that they, they become like an unelected official, right? That, mm -hmm. they, that they have this enormous power over policy. And, yeah. and, and once you get to that place, I think it takes a very special person to keep that from changing your head, from changing your brain. Yeah. Where you start to believe that you deserve that, that you've earned that, that you have the right to make decisions for other people. I, I think some people are able to get that level of wealth and power and still keep their head. I, it does happen. And mm. I think it's a difficult thing. I think it's very hard to hang on to your soul. So the, the humility is, is that you can't amass that amount of wealth and that amount of power. And you could think, okay, I'm going to do this because this is going to cause A, B, and C to cascade. This is what the results of my action is going to now be. The reality is, is nobody has any control over once you make that choice or to do something that is it, how it's going to f unfold and how yeah. it's going to turn out. So the, the arrogance, even if somebody is, you know, the reality is, is like, look, I think this is a problem that we need to solve and I'm going to try this, you know, and, and see what happens. I want to do something. That's different than saying I need to do this or humanity will die because you just you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen and what are the things in place that you need to do to be able to stop that. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I, as I said, there is a megalomania to that. I mean, uh, not to bash Elon Musk, but he honestly does believe that the only way humanity is guaranteed to survive 
is if we're a multi-planet species. And so he, he has this dream of establishing permanent habitation on Mars so that humanity is now multi-planet species because he honestly believes, and he said this in a number of interviews, it's the only way humanity is guaranteed survival is if we're in more than one place. You know, if a giant asteroid hits the Earth, every human will die because there aren't any humans anywhere else. And again, I'm not bashing him, but I think he honestly believes that is true. And you're right. There's no way to, there's, you know, you, humans have such limited control over everything. But humanity is filled with people like that who believe yeah. I have the answer. The only way humanity will survive is if my answer gets implemented. Yeah, see, that's what's scary. So the, the thing is, is that I'm, I'm not arguing against people doing what they think is the right thing but it's the certainty that yeah. scares me I, i'm, so, I'm so, incredibly so, frightened by certainty i'm in, in any way. i'm in, in, yeah. yes i'm extremely i am frightened by certainty so when has to be certain yeah that he's right to be start blowing up his own people yep and so the megalomania and the arrogance within that makes jules pierre mal unique uniquely scary to me is his certainty in what he's doing. And so there are people, you know, that are doing things that like, I hope this is going to be the right thing and that this is going to be for humanity. And I hope we're making these right choices and you, and you struggle to make the right choices every day, but you don't have certainty. You don't sit there and say like, I am, I know better than anybody else. I know these things. You like, listen, here's some strategies. Here's some things that I'm thinking of. I think this is right, but let's see what happens. It's yeah. just, it seems like a small detail but it's a you know it's a really big difference i think i think the six people are like that listen to us are like what the fuck are they talking about like move on guys <laughs> so or, or maybe that's just clint okay now we're back on the rossi amos is getting concerned about prax it really starts back to last episode when they're on the martian ship and they're going to get bullets and energy and gas and all the, those things and um not gas they don't have gas in space for the <laughs> fuel. And he notices Prax just take a lifeless dead body and throw it to the side. And Amos started paying attention that something is changing him, that that anger and that resentment is now taking him over. And all the things that really, he really loved about him and that, that he really liked about him and, and that connected him to Prax is Prax is losing that. And he's starting to get transformed by this anger and this resentment. And Amos has seen this over and over and over. And he's starting... Prax's behavior is starting to reflect the people that he recognizes. And Amos does not want this to happen to Prax. Even when they go to, you know, they're, they're, he's teaching him how to shoot a gun. He's shooting at the thing. And he's saying, listen, the most important thing is we get your daughter. And Prax is saying, well, yeah, but if we don't get her, we're, we're going to get revenge. Revenge is going to be a good thing to get too. And so this is Prax slowly going down that, going, falling into that hole. And this is concerning Amos. Again, you know, we talked about this last time with, with he expects to find May dead or, or turned into a monster. He, he's, he expects that to happen. And, you know, initially we talked about how he was delaying because he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to see it. He didn't want it to become real. This is another defense mechanism. It's like he's going to act like it already happened. He's just going to get mad. He's going to be ready to take revenge. That's going to be the thing that lets him get through it, right? He's trying to find a path through the horror of his daughter's death. And he's just grabbing onto whatever he can, any handhold he can grab onto to try to find a path through there. And he's been hanging out with Amos. And I think in some ways he sees Amos as what he needs to turn into because Amos isn't affected by things. Amos isn't horrified by things. He's not scared of things. And Prax is like, oh, if I was like Amos, then my daughter's death won't devastate me. And he's trying to figure out how to do that. But he's not. He's not, you know, he's not that guy. And he can't find a path from where he is to what Amos is. So he winds up with this weird sort of angry middle ground, um, which Amos recognizes. Yeah. And Naomi finally explains to Holden that the reason she did what she did with the proto molecule is because she has a kid and she pictures her kid as one of those belters. And she knows that the belt needs the, the weapon too. If there's this big powerful weapon going around, they need to get, they need to have it. And Holden says, I don't like what you did, and I never will like what you did, but I understand why you did it. And so they're starting to heal those wounds, and we feel like there's going to be reconciliation between the two going forward. Yep. And Alice gets a call from his kid. Now, I don't know if this is because I have 
two sons. And but I think Alex did a really great job in this scene, and I was really moved by it. You know, the, but one of the things that you see, which is so sad, is this you know kid who is idolizing his father, who has this narrative of what his father has went and done in the fights that he's fighting, and yep. basically Alex is now getting kind of a firsthand seat. This war that's completely a lie in that there's this power grab for this new weapon and there's just all these horrible things that are happening and all the mantra of Mars and Martians or whatever, at its core, it's not really there. And he sees this little, his, this little boy who's like, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a warrior. Yeah. But you, you have to think, shit, man, like a warrior for who? And, and, and this poor kid who's pure and has this pure vision and it's just not what this kid thinks it is. Well, and you have to you have to look at it as how many lives are being thrown away for no reason, for bullshit. Yeah, because because people have been dying, yep. you know, this this whole time. Yep. You know, and it's just a few of these people at the the, the top of this, the echelon, the power echelon that are playing these little board games that are just getting people killed left and right. Yeah, and that's and that's basically all of human history. It, right. we're, it's happening right now where we're yeah. looking at things that have happened and, and saying, how many lives did we just flush down the toilet for bullshit? It's constantly going on. And it's, it seems to be a sickness that the human race has that we, we all start playing our little petty games mm-hmm. and there's a real human cost. There's real lives yeah. that are thrown away over this stuff. And we never, we never count that cost. We just sort of, you know, my team won. So, you know, yay, it was all worth it. Yeah. You know, and, and even not even just like in war, like, I mean, I think there have been, I don't think there's ever a righteous war, but I think certainly think there have been justified wars. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when the Axis and Allied powers were fighting in World War II, I think that there was absolute justification for that war. So I'm not saying there's never a justified war, but what I am saying is it's often not that it's often political. It's like, you know, there's political goals, power and those sorts of things. And war becomes a tool of those. And Actual lives, actual humans are sacrificed to that cause. Mm-hmm. I could see like a, a guy like like Alex who's looking at that and going, "Do I want my son to be sacrificed on the altar of somebody else's political objective?" But also on top of that, what you're talking about is also people's personal. To go back to what we were saying earlier, their their personal insecurities and fears are having such an exponential effect on the world, like not to get too political, but if you go back and read about Nixon, if you you can go back and listen to his phone tapes and Vietnam and everything, so much of what was motivating him is his need for respect, his need to, for power, his need to get back people that get one over on him. And so, you know, the whole disaster of Vietnam just kept getting exponentially worse and worse and worse because People didn't want to deal with the political fallout or take that personal hit to get yep. us out of there. And you get you get mired down in these terrible, terrible situations and personal ego and fear and insecurity is what drives it. Yep. And it's and it's so unholy and dirty. And that's what happens. You know, and unfortunately, that's what happened. It continues to happen. Yeah. I mean, my my uncle was came back 90 percent disabled from Korea. And I know he spent the rest of his life wondering, like, what was I doing over there? What, yeah. what was the point of all of that? He didn't die, but a lot of guys he knew did die. Yeah. So he, he at least got to have, like, some semblance of a life after that, although it was dramatically different than it would have been because he was right. so disabled. You think about that, and you think of, as a parent, you'd see your kid going, hey, I want to join the military. And you, you have to start thinking about, like, do I want to see him get sacrificed on the altar of someone else's ambition? So that brings us to our list. <laughs> in honor of the mutiny, where God rest his soul, Souther takes it in the chest. We decided to do our top five movies about mutiny or movies that have mutiny in it. Now, my list is not fast, but I think there's some good ones here. You know, you rack your brain. It's, everybody that's listening to this right now is going is, is like uh, the mutiny on the bounty or the or the cane mutiny or whatever. Yeah, we got those yeah. in the list, and that's going to be in there. But if you think about it. That list runs out pretty fast. and uh, But here's the list I have now. Pirates of the Caribbean, The Hunt for Red October, Crimson Tide, Wally. So the three mutinies on the bounty, the 1935 version, the 1962 version, the 1984 version. Or you could say the Clark Gable version, the Brando version, or the Gibson version. 
um, the Kane Mutiny, uh, the Battleship Potemkin, and Space Mutiny. And if I miss any, uh, Producer Clint, because I'm sure he's just... Uh, no, that's literally every Mutiny movie. You got them all. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Clint. Um, you can go back to your video game. Now, I think I've seen most of these. I, I, I've seen every movie you, you mentioned there. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm trying to see if, there, if there's one I haven't seen. No, I've seen them all. So this will be interesting to talk about. Now, I mean, the reality is, if you want to think about the number one spot, the bad guys in Die Hard essentially had power of that Jesus. Nakatomi Plaza. Not today. And Not today. <laughs> they, 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 they occupied Nakatomi Plaza, and yeah. Bruce Willis came in to take it over. So, I mean, that's kind of a mutiny. Wouldn't you say? Um, Words mean things. So, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. So the to me, the mutiny is Ellis turning on his bosses to side with the mm. terrorists. Yeah, against that's the real mutiny. That's the mutiny. Ellis is the uh, mutineer. Yeah, he turns on yeah. his own people. To side yeah. with the terrorists. That's mutiny. Because, yeah. because technically, McLean is not, he's not a part of the crew. He's not, he's a, part not a part of the part crew. Of the team. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In order so, for it to be a mutiny, you have to be a member of the crew. Yeah. 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 But Ellis definitely mutinied against uh, Mr. Tagagi. Yeah. So some of my favorites definitely would be up there would be probably either Crimson Tide or The Hunt for Red October is tied for number two. As mutinies go, I think... Crimson Tide is a better example of mutiny than Hunt for Red October is. Hunt for, I think yeah, Hunt for Red true. October, Hunt for Red October is, I think, a better movie. Uh -huh. But Crimson Tide is a better example of mutiny. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Now, I'm a huge Crimson. fan of the Kane mutiny because I'm a massive Humphrey Bogart fan. Bogart fan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Humphrey Bogart's probably my favorite classic actor. And, and it, ha it has the nostalgia factor for me because my dad showed me that movie. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, and my dad loved Humphrey Bogart, too, because we watched that, and we watched The African Queen. It was like a double feature. Oh, and, nice. Uh, oh, African Queen is one of my favorite movies. So let's put The K-Mutiny at number two. We'll put Crimson Tide at number three. And then what's your favorite Mutiny on the Bounty movie? I, I, think I'm, I'm, I, I love Marlon Brando. Yeah. Uh, but I think the, I mean, the Mel Gibson one is more watchable. Like, it's a really well-made well, movie. Well, the but Mel I, Gibson one, I think, is has a more accurate thread because like, so if you take the 1930 movie, like Bly was like the, the straight up villain yeah. and then uh, Gable's Christian was the good guy. Whereas right. I feel like the, the 84 Bly seemed it, it, that seemed more in line with history. Yeah. And it's just a good movie. I just love that movie. Well, and, Brand, and, and, and by the way, the behind the scenes Brando of Mut mutiny on the body is probably like him at his most crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I think I think Brando at his most crazy is uh Island of Dr. Moreau. Uh well, no, because he was he was there for a couple of days. You know, he just didn't his the crazy that is showing up like a month late. You remember we told that story on Ron's podcast. Yeah. But on this one, he literally would like he, there, there's a whole list of like shit that he did in this that is hilarious. But on on on, on this movie like a buddy of his was getting married. He made the studio fly in like champagne and shit for this. And he, I don't know. It's like all this stuff is, is he was insane in this movie. So which one are you thinking? Let's, uh, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go with the Gibson. The, one. Well, and the Gibson one has Sir Anthony as Bly. Yeah. Who's, who's an amazing actor. And, and really, as you said, gave that character some real sympathy. I mean, he's, you feel sympathetic to Bly. Yeah, in in that because Anthony Hopkins is playing him, and 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 like you see how much what what that mission matters for him personally and his career, what he wants out of his life, and the, the ways in which it is failing seem very personal to him, and the way uh, the way that that drives a wedge between him and his very good friend Christian. It's it's beautifully made. It's a beautifully made movie. I just like Marlon Brando, but yeah, the the Gibson one is probably the best of the three. All right, we'll do the, the Gibson one. I, I'm sad. I'm sad that uh, Space Mutiny isn't making the top five because I have great affection. <laughs> great Space Mutiny is is part of my holy trinity of mystery science theater movies. My top three of all time. Space Mutiny is on that list. And um, if you haven't fun fact, yeah, fun fact, our producer Clint 
his other job, his, his less important job, the job that pays less money, but he does it because he feels sad for them, is he's producing the new Mystery Science Theater revival. Uh, the one Wait, that it, just, it, pay, it pays less than zero? Yeah. Yeah, he actually wow, pays yeah. them to work on it. <laughs> okay. he, he pays them to work on it. Cheap at any price, guys. Cheap at any price. <laughs> he just wants to hang out with Felicia Day. But uh, that, if correct me if I'm wrong, Clint, but that had one of the most successful Kickstarters of all time, did it not? You know, we did not overtake goddamn Critical Role, but we had a, a, a very strong showing uh, this time. And thank you, everyone, for their support, if you happen to support this Kickstarter. Yeah, so so Clint is going to be making the new Mystery Science Theater episodes with uh, that whole gang over there. I've already told him that when they're shooting, I'm going to come visit their set and, and bug all the people. So uh, He did tell me this. I have not told him where the shoot is, but I, he'll find a way. You can't stop Ty. He'll find it. <laughs> uh, I think number five, out of honor of Sergi Eisenstein, we have to do uh, Battleship Potemkin. Because uh, for those who don't know, it was a Russian director who revolutionized editing. He was also an editor. And uh, there's a sequence in there called the Odessa Steps that really changed the, where, where he slowed down time. And there's an homage to that. If you saw the, uh, the Untouchables with Kevin Costner, they did, they did a, an homage. The train to station that steps. steps. The train station steps. Yep. That's a very film school answer. Because the only people in America who have ever seen Battleship Potemkin are people who went to film school. Well, you saw it. You didn't go to film school. But I'm a film nerd. Like, there's very few film nerds at that level. One thing that really impressed me is uh, Tarantino was on one of the late night shows, and they would take old VHS tapes and read the description oh, of yeah? the VHS, and Tarantino would guess the movie. And he got a few wrong, but the fact that he got, like, and, but he was... He was all, if he got him wrong, it was because, like, th there was one where the movie was called The Rockwaller, but he knew the original title, but sometimes they would take the title right. and change it. Right. But he knew the original title. And even if there was one that, like, he knew who all the actors were, it, it was extremely impressive that, that he did that. I would like to see how you would do with that challenge. Uh, it depends on the time period, but there's some time periods where I would do pretty well. Yeah, I've got some time period strike zones that I think I would do well in, but especially if you told me the actors. Yeah, but to be able to choose any time period, that would be tough. Yeah, yeah. Well, so if you if you haven't seen uh, Mystery Science Theater's Space Mutiny, definitely check it out. It's um, one of my favorite Mystery Science Theaters all time. It is incredibly funny. And uh, Clint probably knows this, but there's a, a sequence in there where the main character is sort of just this big muscly meathead, and they start making up names for him. So <laughs> like the... the, the the robots are just they'll call them like, you know, slab hard cheese and flint rock jaw and squat ram thrust. They're making up all these names for him. And there's a sequence in there where they just run through like 50 of these names in rapid succession for this guy. Um, for a long time, that was my writing partner, Daniel Abram. That was the ringtone on his phone. So every now and then you'd be hanging out with Daniel and all of a sudden from his pocket would come, we put our faith in slab, rock jaw, squat, ram thrust, brick, hard cheese. They would just like coming from his pocket. It's is, fucking is Daniel, hilarious. Is Daniel a science theater fan? Uh, he only watches fan? the ones I tell him to watch, but he, oh, okay. he definitely likes the ones I tell him to watch. Like he, he doesn't watch them all because Mystery Science Theater was great, but it was a little hit and miss depending on yeah. how good the movie was, how funny the movie right. was. Um, right. So he doesn't watch them all. But if I tell him to watch one, he definitely watches it. And he's really liked all the ones I've told him to what watch. What are your so. three favorites? Yeah. The, the, the holy trinity of Mystery Science Theater for me. And I know there's some going to be some disagreement here because not all of these are Joel episodes. And you get the Joel purists and they get really mad at you when you like any episode that isn't Joel. My holy trinity is Space Mutiny, Hobgoblins, and Outlaw. Those are my three. We should do uh, a special time that guy in Mystery Science Theater episode. Clint, make it happen. Do you know Felicia? I mean, I, I know Felicia and Clint knows Felicia. Maybe we could convince Felicia to come hang out and talk about Mystery Science Theater. Clint is not answering that. Clint, use your, use your, use your authority as the new line producer for Mystery Science Theater to force Felicia to come on our show. Look at, look at, look at the silence here, man. He, he, you know, Clint listens to us maybe 25% of the time. Yeah. On there, and this is just—I mean, how many times were we like, "Hey, Clint, who was that?" or "What was that?" And it's just silence. Just well, he's got—he's got an Alt Tab out of World of Warcraft, so that he yeah. can like pay attention. Oh, to what so we're he doing. goes in there. Yeah. Should I announce our role playing game that we're going to do on the podcast? Should I announce it now, or do you want to wait and do it? I—I I don't know what you're talking about. 
Oh, oh, we're, so we're not going to announce it now? Okay, I we'll have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I have categorically denied the role-playing game uh, <laughs> idea. So the, our list is one Die Hard, two Crimson Tide, three 1984 Mutiny on the Bounty, four Kane Mutiny, and five Battleship Potemkin. So we hope you guys agree with that list. If you, let us know if we've messed up, if we left something out. I couldn't find, a, I couldn't think of a lot of. And, and Space Mutiny as the honorable mention. Space Mutiny as the honorable mention, especially Mystery Sciences Theater 2000 Space Mutiny. Um, thank you guys for coming out. Please support us, like and subscribe, and uh, so we can continue doing this. Uh, it's been fun for us. Uh, say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.